Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the Henderson Small Companies Investment Trust PLC. It's a quoted um, investment trust investing in uh, UK um, and small cap companies. Um, it's part of the FTSE 250, um, and I've been the portfolio manager now for the the last um, nearly 19 years. Um, I'll talk to the team myself, and then talk about an overview of the trust, a bit about performance, a bit about the, the portfolio as it stands, and an outlook for the UK small companies market. So start off myself, um, as I said, I'm, I work at Janice Henderson. Um, I head up the UK Sport Men's Small Cap team. I've been here for nearly uh, 19 years. <clears throat> and um, all that, I was at Morley Fund Management for um, 10 years, so 28 years experience in uh, Mid and Small Cap. Um, two principal colleagues work with me on the Small Cap side, um, Indri and Shiv. Indri's been on the team now for um, over eight years and Shiv for nearly five years. And we're the three principal individuals involved in running the portfolio. Luckily, Janice Anderson has a large and varied um, team, obviously significant asset manager overall, which we can obviously dial in and use those um, attributes and skills of the other individuals which are listed on that page here already. But for the sake of this portfolio, it's really the three of us are the key individuals. Um, start up, I suppose, really by giving the helicopter pitch for smaller companies. Um, so really the killer chart really is the bottom right hand slide there. And why you should bother thinking about investing in a portfolio of listed UK smaller companies. Um, as you can see there, the very long-term returns from small companies are extremely good. So over a very long period of time, back from 1955, that 65-year period, uh, small companies have done almost seven times as better as an investment in a large cap portfolio. Um, that is essentially outperformance of 3.3% uh, per year every year for the last 65 years. Now, do you recognize that small companies are less liquid, um, more volatile, more prone to the economic cycle? But if you take a long-term perspective, the returns are extremely good. Um, the reasons why small caps done very well are on the, the right hand side of that page, left hand side of the page there, sorry, I'm going to go through in detail. But clearly the law of small and large numbers works very well in the sense that growing from a smaller base is much easier than from a larger base. Um, so compelling reason why small companies make a, a good part of your portfolio overall. Um, talk about the trust itself and I'll run through some of the detail and come back to the portfolio. So pretty clear investment objective. Um, it's to maximize shareholder returns by investing in a portfolio of listed UK smaller companies. Um, benchmark is the Numis Index, which is the bottom 10% of the UK market by market cap. So think of any company blur, about one and a half billion being in our investment sphere or horizon. Um, fee structure, a very low base fee, 0.35% per year annual basis, uh, very competitive compared to other products. Um, we have a performance fee structure on top of that. Um, clearly, performance fee is only paid if we outperform, but is also only paid when we produce positive returns from a, both a NAV and share price perspective. Um, and there's no carry forward. And so, for example, if we end up from an affording market, we no performance fee is payable. And the total fees gap to 0.9% of NEV in any one year. Um, performance, I'll talk about a bit more detail later on, but just in terms of consistency, um, it's in my tenure, so I've been um, here on board in October 2002, so 18 financial years, we've outperformed our benchmark in 16 of those 18 years. So clearly a pretty consistent long-term track record, which we've got some numbers later to talk about. Um, size of trust, it's um, now reasonably large and liquid. Um, just went through a billion on all aspects. So gross assets, market cap, and then net assets. So obviously reasonably large and uh, liquid in context of, um, of an investment trust. Yield, we do pay a dividend. So um, you know, the current yield is 1.9% on, on the shares they stand today. Um, and again, we've got a slide later on about our track record on dividends, which has basically very strong growth um, since I took over. And then lastly, I suppose a competitive advantage or differentiation between a investment trust and an OIC is the ability for an investment trust to gear. Um, we have got gearing in place and have used gearing to positive effect over the last 18, 19 years. Currently it's around 9.5%, um, provided by a combination of uh, a long-term private placement, uh, 20 year uh, and flexible bank borrowings. Um, just an overview of the trust and how we do things. Obviously, very summary slide here, really, but just give you a feel for the, the way in which we invest and how we construct portfolios. Um, so from a very top-down perspective, we are growth investors. We do believe in investing in growth companies. I think that's about that's, that's essentially the future. That's what small companies are all about. Um, but we do think valuation is important. So you know, we've got to pay the right price for companies we invest in. And so we've, we've got growth at the right price, growth at a reasonable price. Um, 
as you'd expect from the small companies investor, we are very much bottom up. So fundamentally, it's us about focusing on the companies uh, and looking at the, um, the individual um, attributes and merits of individual companies. Um, to be top down plays a part but for us. Um, most of our alpha creation and value creation comes from picking the right companies. Um, obviously, a very rigorous investment approach. Um, obviously, honed over the last 28 years. Um, and really that revolves around a lot of that things, but clearly meeting companies is very much one important thing of it. As a team, we get phenomenal access. Clearly Janice Henderson is a very large investor in the in, in global markets and also a very large investor in UK small cap. So clearly if we want to see anyone or have that kind of ability to access, we've got you know, obviously a um, good ability to do that. Um, and you know, we'd look to see at least our investment companies at least twice a year um, to follow up on um, on kind of um, on their, their what's their strategy and how they're doing going forward. Um, the things that we look for in the companies we invest in, we call the four M's. These are the key characteristics that we like our companies to display and demonstrate. And what are they? Well, they are model management, money, and momentum. So model is around business model, um, economic franchise, competitive advantage, management, clearly obviously demonstrable by the fact that you know clearly it's the people at the top who run the business and we obviously get have great access to them and meet them on a very regular basis thirdly money is balance sheet and cash flow um so since we structure balance sheets of strong cash flow dynamics and then momentum is around earnings momentum trying to find those companies that will essentially grow faster the market and ever deliver against expectations um we are have a run the winners approach so essentially we're looking to invest in companies when they're small and hopefully they'll grow over time um, and you know, fundamentally, it's about funding those companies that will grow to being big companies over the over the future. Um, and you know, so we will not really look to divest it unless it gets to the FTSE 100. Um, this leads to a pretty long-term approach to investment. So the average holding period in our portfolio is um, nearly five years. Um, and you look at our top holdings, and they'll be known for for multiples of that period already. So clearly, it's a very long-term approach. And as you expect, with any portfolio, um, there's risk controls in place to ensure no over concentration in stock or sector positions. So a good um, kind of risk of mitigation in that respect. Uh, performance wise, just to bring it up to date, I mean, um, you know, we've got track record is good. Um, certainly um, in terms of the short term, it's been a phenomenal year. I'll come back to that in terms of what's been going on, uh, but clearly a strong, strong, strong absolute returns and uh, very strong relative returns as well. Um, off middle medium term record three and five years again, it stacks up very well. The key number for me in this slide is a longer term track record. So. The um, you know the 31st October 2002 is the date I um, started running the trust, uh, and over that nearly 19 year period, we produced compound returns of 16.7% per year every year, outflowing our benchmark by 4.3% on average every year. In the joys of arithmetic, that means we've um, produced nearly well, some 700% total returns, and over double our underlying index. So clearly a very strong long term returns from the portfolio uh, and what we've been doing, and that's that's obviously history. But um, we're obviously aiming and achieving to do exactly the same thing in the future, uh, given we're not changing the style and process we're going through. And just in terms of our um, you know, performance versus peer group, again, relative, it's, it's important because you have the ability as investors to go where you want. Um, and you know, our long-term returns compared to our peer group are again very strong. So upper slipping left to right chart here shows that we've outperformed our peer group um, by material margin over the uh, longer term. Um, in terms of the, the top 10 portfolio of the stocks, I wouldn't obviously given time, I won't be going through it all in detail, but um, you know, you can see here a, a kind of a number of names, a very diverse set of names uh, across the mid and small cap market in various different industries. Um, this is potentially our highest conviction, long standing positions. Um, we've owned a lot of these stocks for a long period of time. Um, just to highlight one, I mean, Impacts being our biggest holding. Impacts is a fund manager specializing in um, ESG um, ethical funds. Um, it's you know it's seen phenomenal growth. We've owned it now for about four or five years. Um, over that period of time, it's grown very very rapidly. We all know how much um, ESG issues are very much at the forefront of investors' minds these days, and um, we're seeing an awful lot of fund flow into ESG funds. Impacts being uh, having great credibility and long term record in this area have taken on substantial funds. They've got they've got the track record and the and the history, and their AUM doubled last year, um, and I think even grew by. 2 billion in the month of August alone. So phenomenal growth they're seeing. And that's led to very strong share price appreciation over the last few years. Uh, and you know, from a 4M perspective, we talked about those 4Ms. Um, you know, fits absolutely model, you know, very strong business, very high competitive advantage, long track record of what they do, management team, very strong and sensible, been there for again a long period of time and um, you know, run the business very well. 
money, very strong net cash balance sheet and good cash flow dynamics. And momentum, yep, it's been beating market expectations on a very regular basis now for quite a, a long period of time. So you know, we're very we're very strong holders of that and hopefully that will continue to be a good form in the future. Um, in terms of dividend growth, um, you know, we talked about the long track record of dividend growth in the portfolio. Um, this just chart shows you um, the orange bars there really. If you put a hundred pound into HSL um, back in uh, when I joined in uh, 2002, what annual income you received every year uh, for the last 18 years. And with a very low starting base, you can see that very rapid growth of dividends over that period of time, 25.4% you know, uh, growth over that period of time. So taking a long-term perspective, it's yielding uh, nearly 30% on cost without reinvestment. The black bars compare it to the all share. So clearly from a lower starting base, um, the all share growth has been much, much more muted. Um, so it shows you the underlying growth of the portfolio has been very strong. And just to kind of point out a couple of things here, I think if you look at it, um, you know, why is our dividend growing so strongly over that period of time? Um, you know, fundamentally, it's the underlying growth of the dividends of the portfolio companies we invest in. Um, because we are growth investors and we're looking to invest in those companies that will essentially grow the dividends over time, um, what you're seeing here is extremely, sorry, what's happened there? Um, um, sorry. Um, something's going on my system. What is going on here? Um, sorry, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, so exactly, sorry, the, um, the underlying growth of our dividends has come from the fact that we're investing in growth companies which have um, been growing their dividends um, because they're, 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 they're extremely strong cash to businesses. Um, also the fact that if you look at the last year, um, one of the advanced investment trusts is we've been able to maintain and hold our dividend or grow our dividend in times of um, you know, economic stress. Whereas obviously if you invest in an OICA or the all share, it's, been, it's gone down. So a good track record. What I would say though, from uh, this perspective, is don't overstress the dividends. Um, we are fundamentally a um, kind of total return story. And most of our returns have been from, um, from you know, capital gain rather than um, from income. Um, in, in terms of the, um, the outlook, um, Look, I think um, it's been an extremely challenging economic period um, you know, over the last um, you know, 18 months ever since the COVID crisis hit. Um, you know, very markets have essentially fell very rapidly in March 2020 uh, and then have recovered um, very strongly since, you know, initially through a kind of almost kangaroo jump um, increase over that period of time. And then clearly when vaccines were discovered, um, a very rapid depreciation of, of equity markets from November onwards into um, 2021. And, you know, essentially, um, you know, markets have benefited from that kind of anticipation of the perspective that um, the vaccine development will mean that we'll get back to some degree of normality in the future. Um, so I think, you know, from a fundamental corporate perspective, look, I think UK stock market valuations um, are relatively good value. Um, you know, certainly they're very cheap compared to international markets. Um, from an earnings perspective, you know, a lot of companies struggled during 2020, understandably, as the global economy um, saw significant um, downward revision. But we've seen a very strong recovery in 21 and 22 as companies have um, seen a rapid bounce back in their, in their, in their, kind of their, their performance. Naturally, corporate performance has been better than expected. We've been, you know, look, look at the last um, you know, six, six or nine months. Most companies have been over delivering its market expectations and delivering very strong um, earnings growth for that period of time. Um, dividends have been savaged. I mean, during 2020, companies were very much focused on maintaining balance sheet strength and, um, and, and can surely have the, the um, ability to withstand and survive the downturn that we're seeing because of COVID. Um, and there was also social pressure not to pay because clearly paying dividends when you are, um, um, you are kind of um, clearly receiving government benefit um, was clear about social no-no. But we again see strong recovery in that going forward. Um, 2020 saw a lot of equity recapitalizations. A lot of companies looked to raise money and um, you know, bolster their balance sheet. Um, that's basically done now, I think, from that perspective. What we're seeing now is companies looking to raise money for more acquisitive purposes. Um, and on that basis, we've seen a very big pickup in both M&A and IPO activity. Um, you know, if we look at you know, M&A particularly is a very kind of positive feature for the mid and small cap market. Over the um, last couple of years, you know, 2020 was a quiet year for M&A. But as we look at 21, we see a significant pickup in M&A activity in the last few months. Uh, you can see from this chart here, there's a kind of a, a sample of recent deals 
in the UK equity market. Um, and you can see there the kind of the, the nature of who's been buying. And essentially, it's been foreign corporates to, to exploit the undervaluation of UK equities and also private equity as well. And we've had a number of successes. So, for example, we own St. Modwin, uh, Saar, John Lang, Spire, Lectura, Ultra Electronics um, in, in the portfolio, and they've all been acquired or in the process of being acquired. Um, and we think that continues. Um, UK equities valuations are still cheap compared to international markets. Um, which should lead to more urban activity. Uh, and in essence, small and mid-cap are the principal beneficiaries of that M&A activity into the UK. Uh, on the flip side, we're also seeing significant IPO activity. So companies coming to market for the first time. Um, you know, again, 2020 was a very quiet year for IPO activity. Um, and um, you know, 2021 has seen a big pickup in, in that market. Um, we make good use of, um, of the IPO market. We get phenomenal access in terms of meeting companies well before they, um, they list on early, in the early views and get to frame the valuation aspects of the, of the business we're looking at. Um, and then we apply the same rigors and disciplines you would do normally to any other investment, um, but there's some great opportunities. So we go back to our top 10, for example, there's two stocks there, Watch of Switzerland and Team 17, which have been IPOs in the last three to four years have been very successful investments for us. Um, so, you know, we're being pretty cautious about the IPO market. There's a lot of choice out there. A lot of companies coming to, to the market, which we, we're not keen to invest in. Um, but, you know, over the last 18 eight months, we bought five new companies uh, on IPO, of Wave IP, um, Auction Technology, Bridgepoint, um, uh, Moonpig, and uh, Foresight. So some good new examples there. Um, other factors really to, you know, Clearly, kind of things that are kind of um, highlighted in terms of what we're thinking about currently. Brexit's becoming a little passe. Um, you know, clearly, the deal done towards the end of last year. Um, but um, you know, clearly, there's the reality of the Brexit deal. Um, it's a pretty skinny deal and really only about goods rather than services. Um, but it's really more of a long term impact rather than a short term impact. Um, there's always the kind of the risk for the market, clearly, of a mutation of viruses. We're seeing that with the Delta variant. and you know, where companies are particularly well vaccinated, economic activity is seeing some struggles, so particularly in the Asia Pacific, for example. So that's obviously something we've got to be very mindful of. Uh, another thing that's clearly very relevant currently is um, the view around inflation and how permanent that actually is and what's happening with tapering and interest rates and also cost pressures on companies. So we're seeing quite a lot of raw material inflation, um, a lot of co rising costs in logistics uh, and labour inflation too as well. So that's very much in our, in our thoughts regarding the outlook for company profitability. So you clearly obviously there's some caveats there. Uh, market's done very well uh, in the last um, you know, 12 months um, and um, you know, valuations aren't quite as cheap as they used to be, but we're still seeing good opportunity to invest in, in the market. Um, so just to conclude really, I mean, I think you know, from our perspective, um, you know, it's an experienced team of investors, um, over 40 years experience in the team overall. We've got a very good long-term history of outperformance in the team. Um, that got that nearly 19-year uh, period of um, long, strong outperformance and relative returns. Um, we talked about the way we invest. It's been a very consistent approach. It's been certainly kind of um, in, in, in place now for, for the period of um, been in, in charge of the fund. Uh, and we are very much consistent in terms of the way we look at things. Um, Long-term time horizon, average holding period, five plus years, low turnover portfolio. We think a portfolio of high quality um, in small cap companies. Uh, and clearly the trust is a large and liquid trust with competitive charges. Um, that kind of probably covers off my presentation. On yeah, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, we do have quite a few and only a couple of minutes. Um, so uh, kicking off, um, you said you were um, the, on the market size or the, the company size you invest in, sub 1.5 billion. Um, how small do you go? So um, it's interesting if you look at the kind of the shape of the portfolio, I didn't go through the slide because of time, but really we've got a quite a mid cap bias portfolio. Um, why we have that is that because of that liquidity aspect or one of the aspects is liquidity. You know, this is a, a billion pound trust and we run products alongside it with about another 900 million. So um, we don't tend to invest in micro cap. So very much more focus on companies above 150, 200 million market cap. Um, and very much going to gain towards the mid cap area of the market. That run the winners approach takes us there as well, really. So this isn't a micro cap product. This is very much mid and small cap. And does that need for liquidity for the size of the trust? I mean, it, it, does that give a ceiling of how large the trust can get? Look, I think the, I mean, when I, when I started, um, like the trust, trust was less than 100 million market cap. So it's grown obviously that period of time. Um, you know, 
we've got, because where we're we investing and because of the long-term approach to our investments, and the fact we take time to build our investment portfolio, and you know that kind of that kind of the view that you know we take a you know, five, ten year perspective, then we can obviously we think we can run more money going forward. So this isn't a particularly capacity constrained product at all. Um, and you've got gearing on the screen there. And the next question was about gearing. Could you talk through the use of gearing by the trust? So yeah, I think I mean gearing is both a tactical and strategic decision. Um, gearing clearly benefits um, NAV when markets go up. And to have that gearing in place um, but it also gives us flexibility in terms of um, looking at new ideas so if we find something we like tomorrow that we think is a really good opportunity to invest in we haven't got to sell something we already own to buy it so it gives us a lot of flexibility around that perspective um, typically we are geared um, and gearing is very between five and eighteen percent of my tenure and the view is markets tend to rise over time um, so yeah over that 18 year period gearing has been a significant positive contributor and um, a question about company meetings. You said you try and see your companies twice a year. How have you done that over the pandemic? And are you back to face to face now? Uh, no face to face yet. We think I've got a first face to face in about a couple of weeks. It'll be quite exciting. Um, look, I think if you'd asked me in 2019, could we have done our job um, at home five days a week? I'd have said no. I think we've all been remarkably surprised how effective it's been. Um, you know, the whole you know evolution of Zoom and Teams and all that sort of thing. So. I think the fact also that we are long-standing investors in the portfolio companies, we know our management teams pretty well, so the ability to you know, have that conversation on Zoom or Teams as we're doing today works very effectively. Um, I don't think it's tenable in the very long term, and I think we're going to go back to a more hybrid model, but actually our access has actually, if anything, improved during the last 18 months, and we haven't found it difficult speaking to or seeing our companies. But it'd be great to go back to face-to-face, -to, -face, to be honest, actually, as, over time. And a question about um, dividends and dividend recovery. Um, has there been a change, or can you talk to the difference between dividend recovery in larger companies and, and, and the, your investable universe? Is, is, have they been stronger for you, stronger for them, about the same? Um, so I don't really spend a lot of time looking at large caps or banks or farms or whatever, but I think you know, from my perspective, you know, dividends fell rapidly last year, probably down about 40% as a composite of the portfolio. Um, you know, and have started to recover as we as we started to go through this year. Um, you know, company profitability is surprised on the upside in the short term. Cash flow has been better than expected, uh, and therefore dividends have started to return uh, quite uh, quite normally. I think it will take time to go back to where they were pre pre COVID. I mean, companies are still being quite cautious. There's still a, a swathe of the of the market which is you know, not paying dividends. So, you know, your leisure and travel companies which are still struggling a bit with um with COVID restrictions, etc. Um, I would like to think our portfolio income will be back to where it was in FY19 by FY23. And a question here on uh, when do you sell? Uh, so sell discipline, I mean, you mentioned obviously when they get too large, but otherwise, when do you sell? Look, I think it's um, it's a corollary of our buy decisions. So fundamentally, it's a change in the four M's that make us think about it. So you know, change in management team, um, new competitor, lack of, you know, lots of pricing power. Um, some poor cash flow dynamics, uh, earnings momentum turning negative, and also valuation. So, you know, because we have got valuation disciplines and we are looking to invest at the right valuation, if a company becomes too expensive, we'll look to sell it. Um, so a number of factors. I think obviously, you know, you have to be a good seller as well as a good buyer to be a good fund manager. It's one of those uh, attributes, unfortunately. It's a final question for me then. What's the, what's the portfolio turnover? So, yeah, it's around 20% on a single sided measure. So quite low, the average holding period of five years. Um, we do believe, you know, it, and certainly in small companies with um, you know, low liquidity, it makes sense to take a very long-term approach to our investments. And certainly it's, it's worked well for us in terms of the, the companies we've got. Neil, that's terrific. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks a lot.